throughout my career at the European Space Agency, I passed many significant events in ESA's history. Milestones, first attempts, landmarks. Looking back, they may appear like isolated events, similar to a collection of single dots on a piece of paper. I want to share the knowledge that I gained along with my journey while connecting these dots. My name is Paolo Ferri. Welcome to my masterclass. Teams in operations are structured in a very hierarchical way, especially uh, for the phases where there are critical uh, activities and uh, critical decisions to make. So uh, every team member has to report and provide the right inputs to uh, each team leader. And uh, the team leader has to ask the right questions to the team members. And then, in turn, the team leaders report to the flight director. They provide the necessary inputs. The flight director asks the questions, the, the relevant questions, gets the relevant answers. And based on this information, the flight director makes a decision. It's uh, different from uh, the cooperative models you can have in a non-critical situation. Eventually, once the flight director has taken a decision, there is no way to uh, criticize it. Your opportunity is before, when you provide the inputs to the flight director. Once you've provided them and the flight director has taken a decision, this is not modified, it's not criticized, it's gone on and implemented. The experience with Eureka, I was confronted with the uh, culture of operations of NASA, in particular NASA human space flight. And uh, this was uh, very strongly oriented towards the total authority of the flight director. In a NASA shuttle mission, the two absolute top authorities were the mission commander, for the astronauts' crew and the flight director on ground. Uh, this was extreme. This was uh, uh, very, very uh, visible in all the situations, not only in operations, also in the meetings. No manager of the Johnson Space Flight Center, no manager of NASA would ever dare criticize the authority of the flight director. This is not necessarily so strong in ESA. We have to continuously reinforce it. It's quite strong in ESOC, but the acknowledgement of the, the responsibility, the enormous responsibility and the relative uh, authority of uh, the flight director is uh, sometimes to be reminded a lot to our managers who have some difficulties to accept it. The main tool for the flight director to take decisions is called flight rules. Uh, this is a set of rules which are developed uh, all together by the uh, project team, the ground segment team, the operations managers, the flight dynamics people during the preparation for the mission. Um, these are rules that uh, uh, define very cl clearly the behavior of the flight director in situations which are not planned. They are anomalous, they, you know that they may happen, but you don't know exactly what will happen. So these are guidelines for the flight director to take the right decision. There's long discussions, you go on for months uh, discussing these flight rules, but eventually, once the flight rules are written and they are approved, they are the Bible for the flight director. So when you come then in the real situation and you have the application of the flight rules, there are occasions where uh, the flight director finds himself into a very difficult situation where the flight rule says something, 
but the current situation uh, is not fitting it perfectly. And in some cases, he may have uh, uh, the temptation or even the strong need to violate a flight rule. Ideally, flight rules should be solid enough to avoid any violation. They should be waterproof to any situation. And the flight director is trained not to violate flight rules, not to question them. And uh, this is generally the case, but uh, I have encountered situations in my career where either in the position of an operations manager, I had to advise against the flight rule to a flight director, or in the position of flight director, I had to uh, accept this advice, and then I had to see inside myself what uh, decision to take, uh, whether to um, recognize that the flight rule was not perfect for that situation, and therefore uh, I have to violate it, or take the strong, uh, uh, strong uh, principle, which I try to apply most in the vast majority of the cases, which is flight rule is the Bible, I don't violate it. It's uh, extremely difficult. It's an internal conflict for the flight director. I have uh, experienced it, fortunately, in very few cases. Normally, it's only caused by the fact that the flight rule was not uh, properly written or not properly thought. And uh, this should not be the case, but uh, nobody's perfect, so uh, these type of situations may occur. One uh, uh, important thing that uh, operations engineers uh, sometimes have difficulty to accept is that uh, their job uh, is not necessarily to deal with uh, uh, their area of expertise directly. For example, if you're a thermal engineer, you deal with temperatures, you deal with thermal behavior of the different parts of the spacecraft. The problem is that uh, uh, the data that you get as an input for uh, your job to, to do the job of the thermal engineer are coming through telemetry. And uh, these data are going through a long chain of units and uh, units that uh, collect the telemetry, condition it, uh, put them in packets, in computers, transmit them, receive them, decode them, calibrate them. This is the whole chain. And uh, the, the vast majority of the job of an operations engineer is to reassure himself that uh, the number that he sees on the display has gone through properly through this chain, all the elements of the chain have worked, and he can trust this number. So before looking at the number of a temperature and saying, okay, this temperature indicates 20 degrees, you first ask yourself, do I trust it? Are all the elements of the chain that brought this number to me, to my eyes, are they properly working? Is it a valid reading? And this is 90% of the work of an operations engineer, making sure that this chain is working, making sure that it can trust these inputs. The remaining 10% is, uh, okay, I now have trusted this temperature, I can work on uh, this type of input, I can use it as an input for, for my work as a thermal engineer. This applies to all uh, operations engineers, to all elements of the team, uh, but it's very difficult to accept for somebody who comes new into operations and uh, he wants to work in his field. Before doing the work, he has to make sure that he has the right inputs. And that's unfortunately uh, a fundamental aspect of our job that has to be accepted. While we tend to proceduralize everything in operations, there's uh, many rules which are, don't actually get written down. It's uh, behavioral rules that you learn only with experience. Um, the fundamental one is uh, uh, when you are running a procedure, you follow the procedure. You don't start deviating because in that very moment you think there are better things uh, to do. You think that your procedure is not really fitting properly your situation. If this is really the case, then it means the procedure is wrong and it means that you're not running the right procedure. If this is not the case, 
it means that you are just letting yourself uh, distracted by elements which are not important. So the fundamental uh, principle there is you've declared that you start the procedure, you run it until the end and you follow it um, step by step as written down in the procedure. And you just stop in case you realize that you're going in the wrong direction, that it means that the procedure is not the right one. Then you have to take a step offline, think of a new procedure and uh, write it, test it, and then execute a new procedure. Um, related to this, uh, of course, we stick to a very fundamental rule, which is uh, nothing that is commanded to the spacecraft is uh, commanded outside a validated procedure. We write and validate uh, thousand procedures per spacecraft, or permission, and we better follow them. Nobody sends a command in isolation just because he thought in that moment is the right, uh, right thing to do. Everything has to be substantiated and validated through a previously written procedure. In an operations room, uh, many people see and follow procedures in parallel, especially when you are in a critical situation like uh, the initial days after launch in a LEOP situation. Um, and uh, this makes uh, uh, the sticking to the procedure even more important. But it makes it also important that uh, each person in his role follows a specific procedure and doesn't jump from one procedure to the next, or that two persons follow uh, a procedure together, sharing the task. So there is a very clear assignment of uh, procedures to each position that then uh, either the operations manager or even the flight director uh, are there to direct and keep running in parallel. But each individual is concentrated on an individual procedure that has been assigned to run at that time. So the fundamental principle is in operations, you only do things via procedures, but also equally fundamental is that uh, one job is assigned to one person there is no overlap of tasks, of responsibilities, and of running procedures. <laughs>